local broadcasters, TV, radio. Uh, I live down on the Gulf Coast. We call where I live in my district Hurricane Alley. Uh, just since I've been in Congress, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Humbart, Hurricane Ike, and Hurricane Gustav have all hit my congressional district. Now, some blame me. That's not my fault. But the, they, here they come, all of these hurricanes. And uh, we're down on the Gulf Coast, and as soon as the hurricanes come through, guess what? There goes the power, electricity. Besides all of the flooding, the damage, the wind, all of this happens when season comes upon us uh, in, in the summer. And so the local folks, uh, to get information, they, if they're still at home, they're watching local TV. Many are not because they have to leave because of rising water and wind damage. Uh, when Hurricane Ike came into Galveston, Texas, it went across the island, and then when the wind shifted, it came back across the island. But that salt water went across and came back. Tremendous damage in Galveston, Texas. And the only thing the people could listen to or find information really was their car radio as they're trying to uh, leave the area. Uh, so the radio stations uh, and TV stations that are still on the air uh, are very vital for public safety and information and about the weather. Uh, they have to li people li listen to the local broadcasters about what's happening right there. Uh, when uh, Hurricane Rita came into to Houston uh, in 2000 and, or, yeah, 2005, uh, approximately 2.5 million to 3 million people evacuated. Now, some say that this is the largest evacuation in American history. I don't know. That's a lot of people on the road, and they're all headed north to get away from the wind and the rain and the flooding that's taking place. And what people were listening to in the car was local radio stations that were on the air broadcasting uh, not just the weather, but the traffic that was taking place. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the freeways, the interstates, all allowed uh, traffic to move on all lanes north. The way the folks found out about that was on the radio. The announcements being made by the Department of Public Safety, uh, Texas Highway Department, that uh, the lanes had been shifted so that everybody could travel in all of the lanes that took place. Um, so that information so vital. But it's not just important during uh, hurricane season. It's important, as already stated by the gentleman from Arkansas, it's important during uh, even uh, normal weather, if we can call what's taking place here in Washington normal weather with the, uh, the snow and the ice. Uh, people want to listen to where uh, to listen to local radio to find out and local television. Also, um, even go back to Katrina. We all remember Hurricane Katrina. Folks in Louisiana left Louisiana, and they came to Texas. And as they were getting to Texas, guess what? Hurricane Rita hit Texas. But uh, uh, Houstonians primarily, uh, when those folks from Louisiana were coming our way, uh, were uh, told by local media on where they could go to take things for those neighbors from Louisiana, everything from uh, food and blankets, uh, and go volunteer to help out to find shelter for these individuals. Oh, local radio, local television is broadcasting how that can be done, how that can be helped to those individuals. That couldn't have been done if uh, uh, we didn't have our local broadcasters who know the area, know the people. We have Amber Alert. That's throughout the country. 296 Texas children uh, that were abducted had been rescued because of uh, the Amber Alert system that was created in 1998 uh, by the Dallas Fort Worth broadcasters. Um, the uh, issue that I want to mention is our, well, there's, there's two more, and they're just as important. Local radio and television has local political issues, 
and debates on our community from the local politicians, the local office holders, and even others. And that's all done locally by our broadcasters on television. It's done by on radio all the time. There's political argument and debate by our local media. Uh, and something that's important to us, I don't know about the Dakotas, but it's important to us, we like football in Texas. We like high school football. And let's be a little specific. On Friday night, Everybody is playing football at the high schools, at the stadiums. Our local broadcasters, yes, they're out there at the stadiums. And at 10 o'clock news, they have a little bit of news, then they have a little bit of weather, and they spend most of the rest of the news broadcasting tapes from the high school football games in the Houston area. They are very important, Mr. Speaker, to know exactly who won the game, who the visiting team was, high school football. We're not going to see that unless we have local broadcasting. And, of course, high school football is on the radio as well. I, I do want to mention that important service that uh, uh, local broadcasters give us. We have a lot of great uh, broadcasters in the Houston area, both on radio and television. I'd like to mention some of them. Um, Channel 13 have Dave Ward. I think he's been on uh, television, uh, nightly news. I don't know. I'd hate to say 30 years, but maybe that's been that long or more along with Gina uh, Gaston uh, on Channel 26. We've got Jose Grignon, uh, Channel 2, Bill Baeza and Dominic Sasha, and then Channel 11, uh, Greg Hurst and Lisa Hernandez. Uh, years ago, there was this local television celebrity that worked for Channel 13. He turned out to be a celebrity named Marvin Zindler. He is an icon in the Houston area. He's a local broadcaster, and he spent time going around in the Houston restaurants, examining restaurants, and as he said, looking for slime in the ice machine. And he did a nightly broadcast on restaurants that just weren't up to, to the health standards of the city of Houston. Uh, other investigative reporters are doing something very similar on a local, on the local basis as well, but it's all local. It's the local broadcasters that are doing it. So I commend the gentleman, Mr. Kramer. I'm sorry I talked so long, but uh, uh, the local folks, uh, we certainly couldn't exist without them. And uh, radio, television, we appreciate what they do, and not just for football, but for the other things as well. And I'll yield back to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman from Texas, and I especially thank him from, for raising the football illustration just because it's an opportunity. While he wondered if it was important in North Dakota, North Dakotans have become very accustomed to coming to Texas for football games because for the last four years, the North Dakota State University football team has won the national FCS championship game in Frisco, Texas. So thank you for reminding us of that. And we look forward to a trip next year, perhaps. Uh, that said, thank you. I appreciate what you raised about um, how, how many broadcast stations really, uh, while they're, they, they are tools of the First Amendment, and they're also obviously uh, an important part of the uh, First Amendment because that's where they derive uh, their rights to express and to broadcast. Um, but where would politicians be without broadcasting debates? So I appreciate that as well. At this time, I'd like to uh, recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island uh, just to, to uh, uh, to let everybody know, this is obviously a very important uh, bipartisan. Uh, this is a very important bipartisan issue. So I recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island. Okay, sure, I, I thank the gentleman uh, for the time and for organizing this special order. And to be sure that uh, folks do not think that uh, local broadcasters are only important in the Midwest. I'm here <laughs> representing New England, yeah. uh, and we have many, many examples uh, where local broadcasters have really made a difference. Uh, in Rhode Island. And I'd like to just, I think sometimes the best way to, to illustrate that is to give uh, real examples of where that happened. And so, for example, there was a documentary uh, made about a homeless man finding help at Crossroads, which is the largest homeless service organization in our state, in the state of Rhode Island. A WPRI TV, the local broadcaster in the city of Providence, secured the rights to this documentary and took the opportunity to create a telethon around its airing. Viewers were asked to open their hearts and their pocketbooks and pledge by phone or online, and that effort raised $85,000 for the shelter 
providing greatly needed funding as the housing crisis and economy create an ever-growing demand for the shelter services. So that's one example. Uh, another example is while residents of our capital city of the